Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the greatest recordings ever. And today, we're talking about Verdi's Aida. Gosh, I love Aida. I have to tell you the story about Aida. No, not the story, the, the opera, but my story. Aida was the first opera I ever saw at the Met. I was at the Met with Leontine Price and Cornell McNeil. And it was the old production. I think it was a John Dexter produced it. I don't remember exactly, but it was the old production where the ballet was the battle between the Ethiopian and the Egyptian gladiators. It was staged that way rather well, I might add. I mean, it worked, it worked really well because that ballet is only five and a bit minutes long and you don't have time to do like, you know, a whole corpse to ballet thing, although people do. Um, and it worked, it worked fabulously well. Anyway, um, I, oh, it just blew me away. My goodness. You know, to go to the Met for the first time, I was in seventh grade, so that would make it in 1973 or 74, somewhere around there. And, and uh, you know, they had these student, student series, the Met did, um, where you'd go see either a dress rehearsal or a matinee or something like that. And it was the perfect first opera because it's grand, the spec spectacle is amazing, and um, it was really, really something. I loved it. I just loved it. But Aida, you know, it, 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 I read, what did I read? I forget where I read it, but it was one of the two or three most frequently performed operas in the universe, along with Don Giovanni, Carmen, and Aida. Those were like the top three in terms of productions up until like the 60s and 70s. It seems to me that it has since um, fallen a little bit by the wayside, and that may be because of the political correctness issue, where you've got to have you know performers appearing in blackface and whatnot, and I, it, it might make some people queasy. I don't know. The story itself has nothing to do with race. It's as it's as totally ecumenical as a story could possibly be, right? It's it's a classic love triangle. That's all it is, and of course the heroine is is Ethiopian, and I mean the heroes, the good guys, are the Ethiopians. Um, so it's, it's not something that anybody should be politically like concerned with, but you never know. And it seems to me that it's less popular than it was. Although some new recordings have come out. The Papano came out recently, right? I have it sitting right over there. Yes, it's, it's, it's right there. So yeah, I mean, there, there have been some, some other, other Aida's recently. Yeah, here it is. Uh, gosh, in fact, it was reissued. I mean, I talked about this. They issued it, then they reissued it. This is the Papano with Harteros and Kaufman and people like that. But it is not the greatest recording ever. Although it's a very good Aida, by the way. No, the greatest recording ever is this one with, not coincidentally, Leontine Price, who was the iconic Aida of the second half of the 20th century. And there are other great Aidas. There's Renata Tabaldi, there's Caballé, you know, and there's some horrible Aidas. Like, you know, <laughs> well, we don't have to go into it, do we? You know, but... It's done some weird things, you know. I mean, Harnoncourt did it, and and and, and Abados. Oh my gosh, it's horrible. Was that with Richard Relly or someone? I don't know. So there were some sucky Aidas too, but there have always been fine Aidas buzzing about. And Leontine Price did it twice. This was the first one. It's with Schulte. Amnaris is Rita Gore. Rodimus is John Vickers. It was always fun to hear. Amenazro is Robert Merrill, who, when he wasn't singing the national anthem at Yankees games, was just fabulous on the operatic stage. He was, he, was a, he was a nice guy, a really nifty guy. And Schulte is conducting the Rome Opera Chorus and Orchestra, which is not the most subtle band in the world, but they certainly are authentic. I mean, you get the echt Italian, you know, rawness and edge and excitement to it. And Schulte, of course, is an, is an exciting conductor. And Price was absolutely in top form for this recording. She really was. It was recorded in... Let me tell you, 1962. My goodness, 1962. Wow, baby. That was a great time. When you think about it, for complete opera recordings, 1962, that was that was when you have the Leinsdorf Valkyrie that we talked about. The Schulte Ring was ongoing as well. And 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 the the Birgit Nielsen turned out with Jussi Bjorling and that stuff was happening. It's really wow, baby. There were some amazing singers back then, weren't there? And Rita Gore is a terrific, 
terrific Amneris. Rita Gore, you may recall, is the Delilah in the John Vickers, um, Samson and Delilah, conducted by Georges Pretre, the EMI recording, and she is absolutely wonderful. One, she's one of those one of those singers. Well, she was into soprano, so people didn't pay much attention. She was a mezzo, and um, you know she she had a very very solid career. She was a tremendously competent singer and someone who occasionally rose to really really genuine heights this is this is one of those performances she's on top of it in the judgment scene oh boy is she juicy absolutely wonderful so I, I mean the cast is unbeatable and Schulte is really at the top of his form and the Sonics are first class and it's just well one of the greatest recordings ever of one of the greatest operas ever. My God, this is a fun opera, isn't it? I mean, she has no dead spots at all. None. Zippo. And the contrast between big crowd business and, 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 and more intimate private moments, it's just, it's so well planned. I mean, if you want to understand how to do drama on the stage, I mean, forget Wagner and those people. He they, they wasn't interested in drama on the stage. No, I, you got to look at this. The way this opera is written and paced and what all the elements are. I mean, some people have said it's the only grand opera from which it's impossible to cut anything. And that's true. It's, it's incredibly cohesive. Mahler was obsessed with it. Mahler was particularly obsessed with the final scene, which he, which he co-opted and, and copied from on, on many, many occasions, including melodically, the second Kindertoten leader quotes directly from, from the scene when Aida pops up in the, in the tomb. Da, 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 ya, da, 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 da. That's in here. <laughs> that tune is taken right out of there. And, and, and there's part of the Adagio of the Fourth Symphony, which tracks the exact pattern of that entire passage, the, the dirge that leads up to the encounter between the two of them, and then that theme comes in, and the Adagio of the Fourth Symphony, Mahler used it a few times. It really stuck in his brain. Um, and, and he also adored the orchestration. The opening of the, of the fourth act, third act, pardon me, the third act, the Nile scene, where the strings are all just going with the, the, the harmonics, uh, the harmonic A, I think it's even an A or something like that. It's, it's with the flute at the top fluttering around. I mean, Mahler's first would not have been possible <laughs> without this. Uh, it's really, it's really a special work, a wonderful work, an influential work, and this is its greatest recording ever. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care. <laughs>